All right, last, uh, last session here, guys. Made it. Um, selfishly, this is the one I'm most excited for. Oh, yeah? that's so sweet of you. Nice. We'll, we'll There's ground only six people in. left, so I think right. we're fine. <laughs> this is less. And thank you all for staying. Uh, so, I, you know, my plan here is to give a little background on, on Horizon and our structure, okay. tee you up a bit, and then I think what folks are interested in learning is how your background is being applied currently and how that will be applied over the course of time. Um, and then we, you know, we, I would love to surface some of the uh, core themes that were brought up both today and yesterday, okay. and, and just get your perspective on how to uh, start to address some of the challenges. Okay. Cool? So uh, Horizon Media, for, for those not familiar, uh, largest independent media agency globally, um, represents about four and a half billion dollars of investments across media channels. Uh, a whole bunch of digital uh, services that we provide to our clients, social marketing, mobile marketing, uh, traditional display and video buying, ad operations, analytics, performance media practices, and now Treehouse, which is a um, innovations lab and creative uh, service offering. Um, on the other side of the house, on the traditional side of the house, we of course have large national and local uh, video buying, audio, out of home, sports marketing, event marketing, so on and so forth. Everything you'd expect from um, again, a large-scale media player. Marianne manages uh, all of our traditional activation teams uh, currently for Horizon Media and has been with us for how five long? months. Five months now, um, and is and certainly a welcome addition. And and then for those who don't know Marianne, she was at NBCU for how long? A hundred years. For at twenty least. plus years. Yeah. Um, responsible for and I'm not I'm not doing it service, but I'll I'll get I'll get to the media stuff. Responsible for sales, marketing. Uh, strategic planning mm -hmm. for the entire portfolio, which is a mere $7 billion or so right. of investment. Right. Pretty sizable stuff. Pretty sizable. Um, so, I, so with that kind of as the background and the context, will you share a little bit about your, your role here at Horizon now? So as Donnie explained, I have all the traditional side of the house. Um, and what, you, what I see going on in that space and, oh, I think what I was brought in for, my mission, or how I look at it, is to look across that landscape and, and not look in silos, not look in the TV silo, not look in the audio silo, but look across and see how all these different media blend together, how we can work at more creative solutions for our clients. A lot like what I was doing at NBC, trying to bring our portfolio together, making, because I think clients want solutions, right? We all talk about what platform and what video looks like in brand and entertainment, but they're looking to solve a business problem and I think we have to look at media more holistically and there's so much more opportunity. But I think what's really interesting for me on the traditional side, if you look at what technology is doing to reinvent to traditional media. So television has video, local has, their, their digital offerings are much more robust. If you look at print, the conversation is more about mobile and tablet, right? If you look about outdoor, it's all digital based media right now. And if you look at the mobile applications, the opportunities you could have there, um, and look at audio, it's all about Spotify and iHeart. So traditional media is being reinvented by digital, and I think we were very good on the traditional transaction side. What I'm looking to do is grow some muscle for my traditional team in this new world to take advantage of those opportunities because I think it's gonna be a little bit of the tail wagging the dog, but I think if you look at print and you look at mobile, all of a sudden print becomes much more wow, okay, I think I want to take a look at this again. It makes the traditional media much more valuable. But I think the opportunity, and I know we talked about data, data, data for the past few days, but I think technology is going to give us the opportunity to infuse this data over traditional media, making those buys much more ROI-centric, much, much more the way the digital landscape looks right now. And I think that's good for everybody as we start to blend across all platforms and become platform agnostic. I know we still don't speak the same language, but I think we're getting there. So yeah. I think data is going to be the way that it's going to, I think traditional media has to catch up a little bit to what digital can offer. Got it. But it's still a pretty powerful, those are still pretty powerful assets with a lot of customer, le you know, legacy value. Right. Now, four months in, um, core thoughts on the differences, primary differences between 
kind of a sales, marketing, strategic planning role versus a, what I would term, and, and this is very nerdy media talk, activation uh, leadership, right? right? It's basically managing investment across a portfolio of 100 clients or so. So sales is much more tactical, right? You're talking about price lots, customer solution, you're trying to figure out a lot of things. I think on the activation side, again, looking to raise the bar, looking, I think, you know, we keep saying the buying has to be more informed. You look at programmatic buying, you look at automation, you look at all the things that are going on in the digital space. How do you infuse some of those best practices on the traditional side? And I think while the sales side was trying to do it, I think everybody was just trying to keep up. Just like, let's get our content out there. Or where should we hold back? There was all those discussions. It wasn't like, oh, data, we have to start thinking differently. It was more like, how do we control our product? How do we hold on to our legacy models? Because that's a frightening world to these things change um, as quickly as they're changing out there and money flowing to different places. Um, so I think the, the thought process is just different. Um, but it's then you're still solving problems, right? You're, it's so the comfort zone is still the same, right? It's still a negotiation. It's still, um, again, trying to get out there and, and solve a business problem for a client or generate sales, right? We're all still working under the same philosophy. Yeah, same core objective. Exactly. Now, you, you touched on a number of the themes that have been surfaced uh, over the past 40 hours or so. A lot about da data, of course. Um, more today talking about uh, custom brand opportunities, kind right. of the, the unique um, content uh, platforms and environments. Mm -hmm. um, we've got attribution and automation, programmatic buying. Uh, we've got you know some of the some of the murkier stuff around fraud on the digital side. Seriously, we got a lot of balls up in the air. Mm -hmm. And then and and frankly, um, just listening to you describe uh, describe our structure, mm -hmm. listening to us both kind of mm -hmm. talk about Horizon. It's a fairly uh, complex organizational matrix. We have a right. lot of people. Uh, focused in a lot of different areas. Um, you know, I guess the, the, the question I'm trying to get to here is, are we designed appropriately to lead on behalf of marketers, or is it going to require, so, it, you know, is it evolution, or mm -hmm. is it revolution? Do we need to kind of reposition ourselves and think differently about the future of, of marketing? Well, I think every company's struggling with structure. Um, I think we, when I was at NBCU, we struggled with where does digital stop? Where does traditional start? Where do they fuse? Um, we use the excuse that, well, well, we don't have the same currency, so we can keep separate. I think that they're coming together. I think as digital was growing as a business, it needed a special, it needed special attention. It needed focus. Um, it is a different language, which I've learned more in the past 24 hours than I've learned in all the years, how different we still speak. Um, but I think they're fusing because content is well, that's why we're all here, right? It's video, it's content. Um, and everybody's getting into video, whether it's print is getting into video, radio, everybody's getting into video. That, that's where everybody wants to be. So I just feel like as things start to blend together, the structures, the, the, the walls will come down. Um, but it's, it's a slow process because, I, as, as people talked about today, the budgets aren't released at the same time. Um, there's different buying cycles. Not everything needs to be bought across platform. There's, is, should digital be bought by TV, like TV's bought? I'm really not sure what the answer is to that yet. Right. You know, there's, there's some complex differences to it. Um, and if you really want to take advantage of what digital is really kind of special about, which is targeting specific. TV's about broad reach. TV's about content. Are they really two different things right now? And should they be bought the same way? Yep. So I don't know. You know, again, I think, like I said, I think the sales organizations are structuring. I think the agencies are structuring. I think the clients are structuring. And I'm sure all of you who put together some of these great programs we saw, you see how many people it needs to, in, to be in a room to get those kind of things done. You know, sometimes it's 20 or 30 people from each side who has to be represented to, you know, um, make sure that their core is, is represented and handled correctly. So I think that's a challenge everywhere, but I do see the structure changing. It's going to have to. Right. I would agree with you there. Um, I had an interesting, very timely discussion with a current client of ours who's here who um, shared a perspective that, uh, that I think is aligned with what you're saying. She's basically saying, hey, as we go toward some of these new media opportunities, uh, if, in fact, the team that I have on my side doesn't have you know, the, the background, the, um, the experience, the exposure 
you know, shouldn't my complementary organization kind of overcompensate for the lack of resource? Right. You know, so should we, you know, very simply, if we're moving more toward a digital mix, should we not have a team that reflects more digital expertise versus absolutely. an account strategy that, that might be grounded in absolutely. traditional media. I don't, I don't have to say it. Absolutely. That's right. exactly just right. Just a yes? It's, it's just a yes. All right, I mean, we're changing it's the organization. A, it's just, again, but how we, I don't Structure think it's a smooth. revolution because I think that both sides have to learn the other um, expertise a little bit, but I think it has to be. So whether it's an embedded person or a couple of people, because there's still, that traditional side still is pretty robust yeah, of course. Um, and has to be handled. I always remember you know, um, being pushed um, when NBC was owned by General Electric and it was like, you gotta get ahead of it, you gotta get ahead of it. And so you can't get too far ahead of it sometimes. You, know, you still have to handle what's being done today yep. and evolve to handle tomorrow. If you get ahead of it too fast, you're gonna miss that boat too. Yep. So you need to sort of be on pace with it and that's hard when the landscape is changing so quickly. Yeah. Now you, you've also mentioned this theme a couple times already and I wanna dig in a little bit uh, deeper if we can. My team, you know, I, I barely know what my team's talking about, right? We, especially you get into like the social marketing insight studio, right. um, some of the people that have kind of a clearer line of sight into the technologies that are moving app installations and, and uh, mobile, um, certainly from ad operations and, and um, data implementation and uh, data strategy. There's just a whole bunch of terminology that's native to digital advertising right. and the history of digital advertising. Uh, on the uh, in your world, right? I mean, uh, where this is a you know, there's certainly bleeding lines mm -hmm. here, but in your world, a bit more conforming terminology, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, meaning from audio to broadcast to out of home, everyone kind of knows um, relatively what they're talking about. How, your perspective, and you've shared this with me in the past, is we we need to figure out how to get these teams speaking the same language. Right. And, I, and to me, that means we're jeopardizing potential opportunity if we're not speaking the same language. Can you can you build off of that? Well, we you know we had talked about this. You know, this everybody talks about this common metric, and you know whether it's OCR and whether there's a debate whether that's the right metric. I'm not really getting into that. But what I when I, when Donnie and I talked about this, what I think it allowed was for the two teams to have an, a thing that they both understood. So for the TV side, they said, "Oh, I get GRPs. I don't have to think about it. I don't know how OCR maybe works, but I don't care. I get GRPs. So now I know." I can buy video cross-platform and not have any issues with it. Same thing on your side. It's, it was a language you spoke, so you kind of understood it, because you don't necessarily understand how TV is done. No, no. So, so again, there's got to be a common language. We keep talking about metrics. I'm not sure that metrics is going to solve it, but that seems, to be the that's, that, that seems to be the thing that we're all comfortable with, so that we don't really have to think about how an ad is served, how it's different than what, how television is purchased, and vice versa. But the language has to become more common, or it's gonna, you know, again, we're trying to do all these new things, but we're, and I was thinking about this with reach frequencies and all the things that we plan, we're still using old tools yep. to plan, yet the world is so different. Should we really be planning on reach frequency? Is that still the metric that's, you know, it's, there's so much going on, but yet we're still holding on to the way things were done traditionally because we just haven't solved for what the new answer should be. Yep. But I think common, it's, it's definitely, the language has to be simplified so that people can understand it. So Marianne and I have spent a good deal of time together in meetings talking to uh, various folks in the technology and publishing community. Um, one, I think it's just uh, rounding out some of your perspective because, you know, again, working at NBC for an extended period of time. Um, but two, it's about trying to educate and, right, and, and trying to figure out where our worlds collide uh, most effectively and then how to productize that and bring it back out to our clients as solutions. Um, I would say that as we get as we get further out, you know, and working with the collectives of the world, uh, John's here from Simul Media, um, Rentrack is here, and, and the list goes on and on. Yeah. Yumi just, you know, showed us some research around cross-platform effectiveness. You know, it's gonna be mission critical mm -hmm. for us to know, you know, what those opportunities look like and how they could be installed effectively. How like how are we gonna do it? What is gonna be, I mean, beyond <laughs> you and me just kind of meeting with everyone, which I think is great, by the way. I don't, I, how are we going to, does it, does it require, does it require giving very specific goals to you know, leadership within our organization that, that stretches their responsibilities? Right. Do we have to mash? I know a lot, I, I, I believe that there's a handful of people here on the agency side who believe, and I, I'm probably one of them, um, that believe that 
you have to have one central leader, right, over yeah. certain areas of responsibility who has a broader perspective and who can kind of help guide and educate the team. But even beyond that, you have to have a client who is willing to do it, you know, yep. like really wants to invest. So, you know, we've talked about how do you take advantage of some of these opportunities, where do you test, and when does it come, stop becoming a test and become a reality? And I think that's the challenge. I mean, if we keep testing, we're never going to get anywhere. Right. Yet, we have to get a client on board. It's not just having one person in charge of activation. It's one person in charge of, you know, getting the whole holistic approach to it. Yep. And, and, and putting, a, you know, a stake in the ground to say, okay, we're going to do this. It's not just a test. And I think it's always easy to say, oh, we'll just test it. We'll see what it looks like. We'll see what it looks like. Um, yet, nobody's really willing to put themselves out there and take that leap. Yeah. And there's got to be a client on board, and then creative has to be involved. Again, it's, it's such a bigger approach than just you and I making that decision, I think. I, would I think agree. that's the challenge. And research has to weigh in and say, okay, this is worth it, and this is something that we're going to deal with, and this is, here's our learnings. Again, not a test, putting a real stake in the ground and making something happen. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Okay. You don't have to answer. For okay. No um, <laughs> is there a world in the future here where folks from my team, are rolling up to you, of course, uh, but managing TV strategy buying activation. You know, I've, I've been advocating that for years, honestly. Um, I just think that we should walk in each other's shoes, yep. however that works, however yeah. that looks. Um, and there was always some, some reluctance on both sides to really want to have that kind of blending. And I think, you know, maybe I'm too old for that kind of blending, but certainly the people under us aren't. No, they're young. <laughs> and they're young. And, and, you know, I laugh that the TV people don't really understand digital. Well, they do it every day. They understand big, digital yep. better than anyone. And honestly, the digital people watch TV all day. So everybody sort of gets what the other does, but we make it very complicated. Yep. Um, and I think there has to be cross-pollinization. I think also there has to be cross-pollinization with planning. Because yep. planning has gotten so integral. If we're going to really bring this together, it's got to start with brand strategy. Yep. And I think that there is a rotation there. We're not making it very complicated where, oh my God, we're going to rotate until we don't know what we're doing anymore. We do, still need specialists, but I think everybody needs a little bit of what the other does because we're never going to come together and break down these silos. It's just not going to happen. I would agree. I think we have a, I think we have a challenging pitch also for internal resources because and there's a general sense that di the digital space is like the place to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really want, you know, I don't want to get exposure to traditional media. Right. Right. That's not, uh, and I think, one, nothing could be further from the truth, right? right. You, 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 a person with a broad perspective on how to activate in a channel neutral fashion is a, a wildly valuable person. Right. We, there aren't many of them out there. Um, but two, there's very few marketers uh, that we get exposed to that are solely focused on digital as a medium to achieve both, you know, um, brand health right. success and kind of right. harvest demand. Um, how do we, I mean, is there, it, is the general thought process that people are going to have to broaden their responsibilities and, their, and there's a good reason for it or what? Well, I mean, TV was supposed to be dead 15 years ago. Print is supposed to be dead. Radio is supposed to be dead. They're all thriving. They're, and they're really thriving, I think, because of technology. Right. It's exposed the content to a lot more to a lot more people on a lot more platforms. It's made it uh, much more consumer friendly. I don't have to go home at eight o'clock and watch a show now. I can watch Big Bang whenever I want and I can watch Netflix and I can do all these other things. So, you know, it just, it seems like, I was hoping we had moved beyond. I, digital doesn't want to be part of traditional. Yeah. Because, I th and I think the TV people are like, oh, I still have big, big buckets of money, and why do I need to play in those little buckets of money? But they see that, few, and it's not just fusing on television. And that's what I think is, is going to really open everybody's eyes. Like I look at my audio buyers, they spend as much time in the digital space as your team does, yeah, right? Of course. Just because there's so much digital you know, um, content out there uh, in audio. Same thing is going to happen with print if you look at mobile and how that's exploding. My out of home person is probably more digitally centric than anyone she because you know, it's most of it's um, you know, digital based media. So, so I think it's evolving slowly without us even talking about it. Yep. You know, we, if, yep. we, if we really took a hard look, I think we're actually further ahead than we'd like to be. I, I'm sorry, than we think we are, yep. um, because so much of it is really happening around us now because it's affecting all media. It's not just video, television. I would agree. I, one of the, so we, Horizon's 800 people or so, right. uh, predominantly in Tribeca in New York, but where Marianne and I are, but LA has got 150 person office too. I, I will say to the credit of an organization our size, 
Um, we have the right spirit. I think we, I think we want, we're you know, we, collaborative by nature, certainly, thinking through how solutions um, could be presented to clients in the most effective manner. I think it, it's just hard to get 800 people marching in a, totally. in a different direction. And by the way, and we're people in a, have day jobs. Yeah, people I mean, do not, have day yeah, jobs. You know, it's, let's, let's not be, it's hard. It's, it's easy for us to sit above it and say, this is the way it should look. Right, but, get it you done, know, when yes. you're Right, but when that you're down work. in the trenches and you're doing your day job, that's, it's hard to look above that. I would agree with you there. All right, so one, we're gonna take kind of a slightly, slight turn, talk okay. about the upfront a little bit. Okay. Uh, get, what is your, so it, to give you a little bit of background, at our, at our table, earlier on in the session, we were chatting about what's working and what's not working with regard to the upfront and the new front. And it was uh, a handful of people from like content strategy mm -hmm. side, Eric Johnson was on my table, mm -hmm. so we had, we had good kind of global view yep. on, on media. Um, I think you know one of the topics that I brought up because it's always been a little bit confusing to me is this notion of buying a bunch of media that doesn't seem tied to any sort of accountability, right? Like we we do purchase a lot of TV in the upfront on behalf of Geico and the likes mm -hmm. of um, Capital One and so on and so forth. Uh, none of I've never seen a I've never seen a a report that says. AMC is doing really well. Uh, Discovery isn't doing so hot. You know, there's there is there is very little like quantitative evidence of the success that I've been exposed to. Okay. What? <laughs> I'm trying to soften this as, <laughs> as much as possible. Now, with that being said, of course Are you I understand. To say we have no analytics. <laughs> well, I understand that the most critical accountability measure is there, which is like, it, you know, you turn it on, it works, people go right. to the store and, and do and, and purchase. I, my, my, that was a long-winded way of saying, is, the up, is that enough evidence to suggest that the upfront is not designed perfectly to enable marketer success today? Is it going to change? And then I would, uh, uh, my second piece of that question is, what do you think about the new fronts? Okay, so I think everybody equates the upfront to the process of how TV's purchased, right? Because you're saying there's no, the analytics aren't the same as there are in digital. Well, that will exist in scatter, that will exist in upfront. The analytics are, the limitation of the analytics and Nielsen ratings or whatever we use yep. exist across. So that, that's a different conversation than does the upfront work or not work. You know what I mean? I, I feel that, the, you know, everybody questions the upfront. A lot of money's transacted in a very, transacted in a very short window of time. Um, and is that the best way for clients to commit and spend their money when maybe their, their marketing plans aren't laid out? They, they're probably spending ahead yeah. of having lots of media plans finalized. They're getting sales data, day, data every day. Should they be buying on a more scatter basis? So well, that's I, what I'm quite, so, so, you're at, so, so that's one question. The data-driven part, I don't think TV takes credit for all the data that we use. I think we forgot a lot of it, you know, because again, it's all transacted on, you know, ratings. So, yep. but you forget about the MRI, you forget about all the tools, the proprietary tools that people use to evaluate television, sales data that comes through. Um, you know, there, there is more data that is really accounted for. Is it infused into the buying process like digital is? It's not really automated enough yet. Right. As I think as we move towards automation, I think we can better infuse that data. And I think that's what, you know, obviously we've been talking about at Horizon, how do we automate some of this traditional um, to make it more data driven? So what do I think of the, so. So, I, so let me clarify. So, so yeah, so the, go back. The, 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 the question is, I, I, and I think, this, guys, this is a theme that I picked up throughout the day, so, and I may be, I okay. might be off. <laughs> okay. um, it feels like the upfront still represents a, an amount of fixed investment. Right, like we have to spend a certain amount. I know there's options certainly that give you some flexibility, right. but they're not structured to be completely fluid. They're not structured to move, uh, you know, across different uh, digital media types or or from offline to online, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, they're certainly not, you know, they're not designed to have budgets reduce somewhere and then increase somewhere else. And I think. I believe at least one of the themes we've been hearing through, throughout, the, uh, throughout the past day or so is like, you gotta move pretty quick, right? You ha that information that you have at your disposal can really guide what you're doing out in market on any given day. If you have a percentage of your dollars, the largest percentage of your dollars that are fixed and stuck somewhere, are you limiting yourself? Are you limiting your ability to be successful? 
So I think that the tra traditional media and TV's, I think, different than maybe print that has longer windows of commitments and things like that. I, I think TV has gotten more fluid in terms of being able to react. Um, it's not just options. You can move media around. Um, as these me mega media companies have gotten so large, there's been much more of an ability to move things among assets. You look at fluidity now yep. across video. So I think people are trying to get there. Um, but, you know, it's funny, I have not heard one client who said, I'm not going to do the upfront because I don't have the flexibility or it's, you know, so it's interesting. There's a lot of chatter about yeah. it, but nobody's really, you know, put their sort of rubber to the road and said, okay, I'm walking away from the upfront because it doesn't give me what I need. Yeah. It still must solve a problem for people or it still must be an effective way to transact because it hasn't gone away. It hasn't changed a bit. Really, it's it, like the timing hasn't changed. We talked about moving a calendar. Some of it's on a calendar. Still transacted at a time before their media plans are done. All the complaints you've heard, but it's and, and all the opportunity. You know, like I understood it when there was four or five networks and maybe ten cable networks. When you look at the opportunity across the board, the fact that people still transact that much money, when I don't know if they have to, right? But they do to hold on to bases, to get you know premium inventory, whatever it is, because it still is supply and demand and there still is that limitation on good supply. But it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that it still really hasn't evolved as the world has changed so much, yep. um, really, to be honest with you. Another area where I, I think there's a lot of dialogue around how to approach the upfront differently. Right. Um, but you're right, I, I, we haven't seen that come to fruition in any meaningful yeah. way yet. I will say, um, for those of you who haven't seen, I don't believe, or I know he's not here, Bon and Bo is the VP of uh, Global Digital, or no, I'm sorry, VP of Marketing now for Mondelez, Global Marketing for Mondelez. Um, he has perhaps the most dynamic perspective on the upfront that I've ever heard just in, mm -hmm. in like kind of speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, a lot of it is like, you know, the portfolio, I don't, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but the portfolio of, of Mondelez brands is such that you could actually not go into the upfront. You could come around the upfront, you know, dress it sure. through the scatter marketplace, yeah, sure. and you wouldn't ha it wouldn't impact you as a brand. Now, or lo logically, it shouldn't impact you as a brand. Now, you know, the, internally, there is obviously some conflict, conflict around that because they haven't done it. Right. But, um, but I feel like we're inching perhaps toward that slowly. Really slowly. I, you know, I, I haven't seen any discernible change, to be honest yeah. with you. It seems like it's the same sort of portion of budgets that committed up front. I think there's there's a certain amount of comfort of having your, your inventory locked in. There's a lot of outs and flexibility in terms of moving things around. Um, I think that probably your TV schedule is your base, and then you build off of that. Right. And you're looking for more flexibility in digital, where that's that two-way conversation, where things change, social, where you might want to be, you know. So I think a lot of the, dy the dy dynamic part of it is coming everywhere else, right. where TV sort of the foundation, creating that big brand buzz, whatever you want to call it, big brand awareness, and then you're funneling it down with very flexible media so you can react from there. Right. But I, I haven't, you know, again, I, we've been talking about killing the upfront and for years, it, yep. it hasn't changed at all. Right. So, so uh, I'm going to contradict myself okay. here, if you don't mind. Um, we, we were talking again earlier about the new front, and folks were saying, or you know, folks from the sales community, I feel like, are pretty actively um, interested by the new front, especially if they don't work for uh, companies that participate. Right? right. So the question is, hey, are the new fronts successful, and what were they intended to do in the first place? Now, I have my view, and this is where I contradict myself. My view is that they were successful because they help they helped uh, flow. Right? They helped mm -hmm. dollars get distributed across digital media, right. uh, and I think we need to arrive there eventually. If mm -hmm. that's a trigger, then so be it. Um, I, it's contradictory, of course, because I am in the background saying, hey, you know, a lot of this information can drive your investment strategy over the course of time. We want to limit those deep partnerships if we can to a certain degree right. until we know that they're really working as hard as, as possible. Do you have a view on whether or not the new fronts are, are good? Are they Well, I think it, it raised a level of awareness for all the product that is out there and how good, the, how good the quality is of product is out there. I don't think that that was known. And, and honestly, what I do like about the upfronts is it gives you a moment in time where you're transacting, uh, transacting against everyone. So it's a really 
it's almost like a secure marketplace. You know what's going on, and you're not blindly dealing and making deals and paying, you know, increases or decreases, whatever you're doing. The market's pretty open, and, and it gives you an opportunity to move money around, to play on an equal playing field with everybody at a particular moment in time and really understand the marketplace where if you go in and scatter or you're doing a deal, you don't really know the value. It gives you, you know, so I think the new fronts allowed the same thing for video. So yep. I think it actually was successful. I think it drove money there. It was, again, a time where you could, you, you were playing all the odds at the same time. Everybody's, everybody's stuff was out there in front of you and you had a big bucket of money and you were able to move it around and take advantage of pricing opportunities. You were, it wasn't just, okay, it's time to do this deal again, it's time to do this deal again. It was, you were able to look at the whole markets, marketplace in, in a bigger, more dynamic way. Right. So I think it does make sense. I mean, again, it, that's your sort of area more than yeah, mine. Yeah, no, but of course. It seemed to make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think, I think generally speaking, more options better, right? Especially at a, a pivotal time in terms right. of investment. I think, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, which is if Google go, walks around, which they, which they have, and says, hey, we're the largest cable network as it relates to reaching adults 18 to 24, 18 to 34, whatever the demographic is, and that's not being thought of and considered while we're going out right. and buying media right. against 18 to 24-year-olds, I think we're, there's a miss, right? right? We should we should obviously recognize that. So, and in large, I, I think I would agree with you. I think it, it evolved a lot over just a couple of years. Um, I would assume what will happen in the future is there will be a more specific kind of solution that's provided and it will be a, a straight up comparative uh, to another like kind of a linear opportunity, right? right? Literally, literally Google versus Hulu right. versus, right. and right. I think that will help you know, demystify a bit as well. Right. So, uh, so we're, we're giving you guys some insights into uh, our organization. I'm going to give you a little bit more. Our, my function is, is largely new business, business development. Um, it is largely, what else do I do? I don't know. I do a lot of business You help me understand what's going on here. I hang out with Marianne. <laughs> um, uh, let's say that um, operations is a large component of what we do. Of course, the team is, my team is 150 people, your team is right. very you size. Have strategy you have. Yeah, of course, right, right, huge teams. Yeah. Um, the work crisis uh, in terms of workflow is very real, right, mm -hmm. in our world. You spend, I, well, we spend a considerable amount of time with our CIO, who's really a CTO, we're bringing on a COO, mm -hmm. right, from an operations <laughs> standpoint. Uh, and the whole idea is to speed up our ability to ingest and learn information, then turn around and buy media as a result of it. That sounds very practical and logical as it relates to digital media. How real is that for offline media? Automation, that it, is. It has to it has to come. I don't know if it'll ever get to programmatic on a, on a large scale, but I mean, we have to start automating some of this process. There's so much data out there that we're not, you know, that should be infused over the buying process. There's so much that we can do to move that forward. I think we've looked at some tools yep. that we think might work very well in the TV landscape. And it's funny, you know, um, a lot of, there's been a lot of press about people automating all types of media, you know, whether it's print, whether it's outdoor. Um, and the sellers, you know, you hear, oh, the sellers will never agree to that. Well, I think the sellers are coming around to it too. Um, I think they know that their inventory, it's, it's, it's going to be an easier way to transact. It's going to be a smarter way to transact. And I think that what's been taken out of the automation or the, the programmatic is that it's not necessarily cheaper to buy. Like, it's not, you're not necessarily cheapening your buys. So I think the, the auction attitude has gotten taken out of the equation and it's talked about smarter, more effective buying. And I think that's what's the, the selling community starting to hear. And I think they're starting to be less fearful of it and they're starting yeah. to open up their, you know, and whether it's, you know, third tier networks, I think it's gonna, it's gonna cover a nice chunk of inventory. How much will be actually programmatic versus just automating a lot of the process. Yep. Um, but I think that's real and I think that's soon. You know, we're looking at something that we might be ready by the first of the year yep. and start testing yep. um, an automated process. We talked to the local community. They're very interested in it. If you look at, you know, if you think national's cumbersome to buy, you have to look at local. If you think local television is cumbersome to buy, you have to look at outdoor. So there's got to be ways to ease the purchase that has to drive more revenue. Yep. I mean, who wants to sit there and look at an outdoor plan when you have to piece together 17 or 30 different vendors in a market, and that's just one market. Yep. You know, so I mean, think about that complexity 
Um, and think about the lack of, um, you know, they're looking at audit bureau circulation numbers. When you can real, have real hard data to infuse in those buying decisions, why wouldn't you try to automate some of this process? So it's not just TV. I think there's a need to automation across the traditional landscape. I really do. I would agree. And I also, it, what's funny is we, the, I think the, the interest around the automation of television is more about leveraging data to buy Absolutely. offline media That's than right. it is about operations because it's still largely far more effective, like efficient right. Right. from a process standpoint right. than any other media. Right. And you think purchase. about like, you know, if you can change the data, if you can change the buying equation in terms of infusing your TV with different data than Nielsen ratings, you've totally disrupted the seller's selling model. Right. You know, all of a sudden their pricing model goes out the window because they don't know how you're evaluating their product. How great is that? You know, that's where it gets started to get fun, you know. But it, is that information, that's, a, that's a, a huge and interesting point, is that information available to the sales Sure, they'll have or? it, but they won't know how your brand is looking at sure. it. So it's widely used, but it won't be scalable enough for them to price against it because right. every client's going to have their own proprietary way they look at the data. Okay. So I think that could be actually really fun. All right, let me see. Where do we want to go next? Um, hold on for one second here. I just want to make sure I got my notes all lined up. Uh, so what, well, here's one question that I think would be, would be great for the room here. You, uh, I th we're alluding to the fact that it's going to require more resources in order to be effective, right? More different resources on our side, uh, a bit of information share out across the community. Like, what are the key metrics that we're looking at that are guiding our investments? Mm -hmm. Do you look across, and, I, and perhaps not the most fair question at this point, but you look across the sales community today and say, these folks really have it down. These folks really know how to partnership collaborate or partner with us, collaborate with us effectively, more folks should work like them. Right. Is there, are there tools and tips we can share with uh, folks in the room? Um, you know, I think, like, and I know ESPN, I don't know if they left, or, but we do a lot of work with ESPN because we're so big in the sports arena, and they have a great brand, right? They have a brand that travels across digital, print, radio, television. They, they know what they're doing. They know how to build cross-platform -plat programs. They know how to do added value. They understand how to partner. Um, and it's not, you know, and there's deals that you renew. You know, I always find the best partnership is when you renew the deal year after year after year. And it covers multi-platform capabilities. So I think they know how to do it well, but I think their advantage is they know their brand. It's just so if you know yourself, you're easier to partner and to work through an organization. When you have disparate brands that you try to bring together because you're trying to create a custom program for a client, I think that's where it becomes very difficult because everybody has their own voice and everybody wants to speak in their own voice. So they have a nice model there, and I think they've done a really good job of, in, of bringing that together under one sales leader. So there's not a print guy, a radio guy. They all sell everything. Um, and then they've infused that with really good marketing. Yep. So they know how to, uh, and they know their audience. They're very authentic to their audience, which I think is really important. So they won't compromise on how they deliver something. So it showcases your brand in the best possible way. Mm. And then we saw some examples of branded content and somebody said, know your audience. You know, you know the YouTube audience. Well, I think ESPN knows their audience. And, you, and to do custom content like that is really risky unless you really know your audience. So I think they do a really good job. But I know there's, there, listen, I think everybody's kind of growing in that direction. Yeah, yep. But it's nice when you have a brand that's just so centric and you know, you know your audience is just so clean that you can work across all the different platforms in a very singular voice. Right. I think that helps. They have a, an excruciating focus on measurement also. Right. I know for folks yeah. who haven't worked with ESPN in the past, and it was a topic that Eric and I were chatting about earlier, these guys go to extremes, guys and gals, of course, go to extremes to prove out that these cross-platform opportunities, right. sponsorships right. are effective. And it's a huge, you know, it, it's a hugely, you know, valuable right. tool in terms of sell-through, right? We want to we yeah. wanna start to demystify whether or not programs like this, especially relatively sure. expensive yeah. packages, are, are working really hard. They do a great job. Well, and that's where, you know, everybody talks about getting cheaper, getting cheaper. And I, know, I heard somebody complaining, you know, digital is not necessarily, nothing's necessarily cheaper. These programs are actually probably more expensive. Yep. And you're willing to pay for them if the ROI is there and if you can prove delivery. And I think they also do a very good job of, I agree with you, following up. And again, we renew every year. Yeah. That to me is the best proxy, you know, the best statement you can have for success. Correct. 
So, uh, w you know, one or two more questions here. The one that I definitely want to get out, and it's, and it's again, a theme that's been, been covered or talked around a couple times. Our world, digital side, we've never really had um, premium content to align brands with at scale, right? Mm -hmm. So we started to focus largely on discussions around data, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about content anymore, it's about insights. Um, your world uh, has always been about I want to see how you're going to say this, because he's going to say there's no data, right? No, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm just saying, I, I, what I would say is it's driven by premium content. Yes. You know, brand safe Fair. environments. Fair. Um, things that are safe bets from mm -hmm. a brand investment standpoint. Uh, I think what, what most people are grappling with on the marketer side right now is how, what's the mix look like in the future? We've seen some unbelievable work that's native to the digital space, YouTube specifically, and some of the case history work has been tremendous, um, but you don't want to sacrifice what's working hard for your brand in the in offline or linear space. What what is the right mix? What's the right approach? And it's tough. That's a silver bullet question, so there's no there's not going to be a right answer. But the but. I think that's where people want to go. I feel like that's the, that's the question. Oh, see, this is where I come up with the language barrier again. You know, t the purpose of buying television is, well, not the purpose, but the philosophy or how television is transacted is on content. It's, it's, it's identifiable, it's protected, you know what you're getting, it, there's a rating, it's measured, and, and, that's, and that's your proxy for audience, right? You, you have decided that whatever environment you want to be in, whether it's news, whether it's today's show, whether it's prime time, you, that's where your audience is, you've defined that, and that's the content you want to be in. The digital philosophy, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. is about finding you, no matter where you are, and delivering you an ad because I know your behavior and I know that you like my product and I'm sending you an ad. So I shouldn't care about content, I shouldn't care about, I mean, and I know that's yeah. an extreme case, yeah. so if you're watching sports, mm -hmm. porn, whatever you're watching, I don't care. Some combination. Some combination. <laughs> it shouldn't matter. Right. And I, I'm, I'm being extreme. Right. I know that's obnoxious, but I'm being extreme. So it really shouldn't matter. So that's where the philosophical difference <laughs> comes in. How those two things are bridged, I don't Very know. Very about the porn remark. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say it because they, they, they were all falling asleep. So I was yeah. like, okay. No, I mean, so, so I think that's the, that's the challenge, and I don't know what the blend is because there's two different buying philosophies. Yeah. You're not buying digital for, con you maybe will move towards content because I see that premium content has more value. So it's definitely moving in that direction, but if you look purely at what the purpose of digital was, it was to deliver an ad to the right person and have no waste, yep. right? Regardless of what I was doing. So for me watching a cat video, or, I don't know, watching something else, it didn't matter that I got you. that ad for shoes, because right. that's what I'm going to get, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's a different, where TV is a different world. So, uh, you know, the, analy the, pro the programming is the proxy for audience. The analytics, yes, could get better, more robust. There's a lot of waste, we know that. So how do we get that? Does addressability resolve that? Yep. To some degree, you know, and if you, so the two sides are blended a little bit more. So premium content becomes more valuable over here, and the audience is more broader. You know, the the ROI metric sort of changes on TV addressability, all kinds of data. Does that make it more less wasteful? Yep. More, you know, um, direct delivery system type thing. So that's how they bridge it. But I, that's the complication. That's, that's where the language barrier comes in, in my view. So you, you, you mentioned earlier, hey, it's too much test and learn stuff, right? right. Like, let's, let's well, get on with it. That's what we talk about it. is test and learning. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think there is a meaningful difference, though. I think what we're saying is, hey, these environments, these emerging environments can bear fruit if you do them in a certain way, if you understand right. your audience and you know what the, you know, the purpose of the, uh, the actual market or the client is there, you can achieve success and you have to. Right. You know, there's no, right. it's not like, let's test this thing and then we'll be right. gone next year. It's right. kind of like right. we're, we're in right. and when we just have to figure out where it is that our total mix of video investment is wasteful and reduce that to, right. in order to afford new opportunities. Right. Seems to make sense. Do you mind if we open it up to a handful of questions? No, go ahead. Does anyone, uh, anyone have any, any questions they want to share with Marianne here? She answered everyone's questions. I so can't see anyone. Yeah, we so cannot see you, so if you do, oh, that's better. I think they want to go home. They want to go, we have two <laughs> minutes. No one's going anywhere. <laughs> hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, so specifically, I was asking about TV just because of uh, what you guys were discussing. That platform sat on top of the Google AdWords platform mm -hmm. and had a tremendous amount of functionality uh, or functionality and could pull in a lot of different data points, uh, very targeted, so on and so forth. What is your thought on that? And now that it's kind of going off into the sunset, any thoughts on maybe why it didn't work or that the TV, um, TV folks didn't really wrap their arms around it? So we actually did some testing with it um, a couple, when it first came out, we were one of the first um, media companies to jump on board and test it out. It wasn't so much, I think they came at it with the attitude of auction and that scared most of the seller, selling community off. Um, and if the functionality of it, you don't buy TV on a 24 hour basis. And I think that was a challenge. So it wasn't that the system was bad or broken or didn't work. They just didn't understand the buying process. So I think, and yes, the analytics, all that stuff was really good. But, and then they tried to evolve it. Oh, you could buy two weeks out. And nobody was going to buy TV and not know what their schedule will look like. Again, TV's bought for content, right? You, you, they want to know, you want to know what you're buying. You know that you can buy cheaper if you buy two in the morning or if you buy late fringe or you buy an ROS. That can be done manually. That didn't have to be done through Google TV. So I think that was the challenge is that they wanted to see schedules. They wanted things. So then I think, like I said, they started working two weeks out. That still wasn't enough. Then what we were finding, we as sellers were putting ceilings or floors, I'm sorry, floors on all of the pricing. So I could probably look at my own buys and we were getting them cheaper. You know, we heard from agencies they could actually get it cheaper if they just did their own CPMs. So it didn't really work and I think it was part of it, digital did not understand the TV buying process and I think it was just ahead of its time is probably the problem. I think we're closer to some sort of model like that now uh, but the analytics there were amazing. I mean, that was, that's, that was really, I think, the missed opportunity, to, to be honest with you. Yeah, I would agree with that. The platform actually worked quite well. It did. From a technology it just, standpoint. Yeah, it was, it was the, unbelievable. Yeah, the challenge was some of the pressure that was it's brought just, on. It's by. just understanding the different, the, it's a different buying philosophy. It wasn't yeah. like digital where you, wanted, you, know, you want the available inventory and you'll deliver an ad right then and there. That's not the way TV works. Correct. So I think that was a challenge. So, and a lot, just a you know, last, last remark here, a lot of what is out there from a publicity standpoint as it relates to automi automating the offline buying side is around planning. It's not, you know, there, there still isn't, you know, there still isn't pipes to distribute digital video effectively across, you know, various cable networks, right? So you, I mean, there's, there are aspects of it, and you, you mentioned them, addressability, for instance, where you, you can have more of a, a true kind of a digital activation strategy, right. but most of the inventory is still, uh, there's still gonna be a manual, manual Right, that still had to be trafficked separately. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't automated like it would be through digital, so it was still a challenge. But this was five years ago? Yeah. You know, it was pretty, it was really ahead of where we are right now, I think. Anyone else? <laughs> So kind of on that same note, um, does addressability and maybe VOD, DAI become the first place where you start having those cross-functional disciplines that cover TV and digital? Because it's limited volume in terms of traditional linear? I think it's, it's probably the only place where you're going to get scale in that, and where, you know, to infuse, uh, you know, I, I don't know that that's the first place, but it's certainly, I think the technology exists to do it or yeah. we're so close to it. And again, there's enough scale there, so it's worth doing it. Um, I think the challenge is on all of this stuff, as we talk about, is where is scale and where do you want to make your bets? Um, but I've been hearing about addressability for a long time now. We're still not there. And what that looks like and what that pricing model is um, is still going to be the challenge going forward. But that technology, that thinking makes a lot of sense to me. How it's actually executed is still yet to be seen. Um, and then what's the value of that? Is an addressable ad more valuable? And how much, how much creative are you going, to, as, a, as a client, going to develop for all this addressability? Or is it just as simple as we'll send a cold weather ad to the north and a hot weather ad to the south? Is it as simple as that? Or is it really going to be divvying up all my brands and sending one to the cheese house and one to the you know, jello house? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, how, how, does it, how does it look? And I think that's so the technology exists. I think people aren't comfortable with what the model looks like from a selling and activation standpoint. 
So if I could kind of recap, it sounds like the, one of the recurring themes um, over the last day and a half has been that it sounds like TV remains sort of the baseline foundation for media planning and that marketers should look at digital as a way to augment or to um, sort of amplify or extend in, in different respects. And so it becomes a TV and then digital is kind of layered on top. Do you, do you agree with that or do you, and if so, do you find that there will come a point because of the data or the analytics that become more mature that there could cross over and digital becomes that foundation and TV becomes sort of that extension, if you will, upon a digital media plan? You want it's both a good want question. To take it? It's a very good question. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take a crack at it okay. first and then, and then you can run with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'll respond by by talking about another agency. I don't know <laughs> if this is comfortable land to go into, but so let's talk about Razorfish just briefly. You know, uh, uh, unbelievable digital uh, agency. Um, they handle a tremendous amount of uh, of marketer kind of strategy, both on the media side, but also on the technology and development side. Those guys have been working for an extended period of time on an offline capability. Um, and it's not, it, it's not to say that they want to replicate what a, what a Horizon could do as an organization, but they, they do believe that decisioning across uh, offline media with respect to data that's fueled digital media in the past is a way to unlock uh, a tremendous amount of value for marketers. And I think you know, if you were to press on um, whether or not that's the most valuable supply available, most folks, even myself included, would say that's you know that's the really good stuff. That's the stuff that drives uh, you know it dr drives audience scale and performance, um, and just could benefit from you know a little bit more of the intelligence that we've that we've been able to gather on the online side. So I, that long-winded way of saying I think I, I believe that traditional video is the base and. Uh, digital marketing becomes complementary. So, uh, you know, I, uh, the way I'm looking at it more simply is follow the content. So whatever, whatever the consumer does and however they consume content is how your media mix or your, your marketing plans are gonna shape up. So right now that still top tier content still exists in traditional media as that blends then, and, and as eyeballs move and gravitate, I mean, you saw the stuff on smartphones and everything else, and I think the media mix changes, but it's all about content still at the end of the day, and each brand is obviously different, how important TV is, what they're trying to do. Some brands I heard have launched digitally and been very successful. So I think it you know, varies by the brand, but just from an overall theory, it's just follow the content, right? That's why we're here, right? Yep. It's still, still good content and where, that, where the consumer is looking for that content. When it all becomes a self-serving, you know, f philosophy where I'm just getting my content when I want it, and I'm never watching television, then traditional media might go away, right? So it's, it all depends on consumer habits, is my view. We are well over time okay. at this point. Good. Um, thank you so much yeah, for joining me you. up here. No it's great Thanks to have you. Me. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you wanna so I I think some uh, special thanks go to Donnie as well. This is uh, not an easy role. And thank you for leading us through these last, uh, last couple of days. I appreciate it. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Uh, I know that uh, I am the last thing standing between you and freedom. Uh, I do think that we've winnowed down to the best of the bunch. So maybe we could stay a little bit longer and just work out all these rest of these issues. We'll set the standards now, right? Um, seriously, I've got a great team that is supporting and, and, and who has made this all possible. So, Videonomics team, Chelsea and Nicole and Jeremy and Media West, the extended team, and Mick. Thank you all for making this happen. Uh, we are uh, already deep in planning for November's uh, New York uh, roundtable for um, March next year, and it's all done based on your feedback. I said that uh, as we kicked off this event, and it, it's quite true. This is the, our secret sauce. So please, the more that you can give us, we're going to be sending around um, surveys. The more you can send us uh, direction on the types of uh, topics you'd like to address, on how we can make these not just great discussions, but actually make some progress on some of these points. Uh, the better. Um, I want to thank you for coming here. Thank you for staying to the very end. And thank you to our sponsors for supporting all this. It's great to have them.
Good friends.